Okay, and we'll have to get it to IT to put up on later. Any problem? Uh, no, I think she's stopped her screen. Hopefully, okay, she's still you. there. Probably, still I am. I am still here. Yep. Yeah. Right. I just stopped my screen. Okay. All Welcome right. to the uh, April 8th, 2022 long range planning meeting. Uh, we need to take attendance. Uh, yes, and since we're doing this remotely, I will go around the table first here in person. Dave uh, here. Yeah. Rachel here. Alan here. Peter? Here. Rick? Here. Jean Marie? I think I'm here. Come on. <laughs> yes. I'm going to go online to Marvin. Here. And Robin. Here. Right, we have quite a quorum. Uh, I guess we may have some public and we have some presenters perhaps uh, later in, in the meeting. Um, first item is to review our minutes of March 4th, 2022. Comments or motion? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Unanimous in the house. I probably need to do a roll call again since yeah. we're on Zoom. Um, and forgive me when I uh, just try to jot notes. Just one. Alan moved to be seconded. I'm sorry, not to Peter. Thank you. Okay, and I need to remember who our alternates are, so I'll do my best to remember that as we go around. Bye. Dave, Alan, Peter, Here. Yeah. Rick, yeah. Marvin, Aye. and Robin. Aye. Liaisons and liaisons, okay. I got it right. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay. Second item is the discussion of marijuana cultivation in rural districts. And if somebody has a presentation, um, somebody has an introduction. Yeah, I'll start with an introduction. Um, so let's see. This item is coming to us sort of in a circuitous route. Uh, um, Karen and I had a conversation with a property owner who uh, owns a farm. Off of, out in the west side of town was interested in potentially doing cultivation on their property and want to do it sort of internal to a barn and, and what have you. As often happens what, when we have these type of conversations, we ask the person to put together a brief narrative, just generally describing what they're looking to do. And we run it up the flagpole of leadership, our town manager, who then bounces the idea off council leadership just to sort of get a sense of what the best pathway might be. And in this case, and just, I think the applicant or the property owner at that time was thinking maybe I go down the contract zone direction, which is still an option. Anyone can always apply for anything at any time. Um, but what we heard back from leadership was, you know, maybe this is really an issue we should think more broadly about. We know the conversation happened Oh, Robin, thank you so much for running across in the rain. You could have sent me on Sunday. <laughs> that was on the coffee. Yes, and thank and you. That's what oh, man, awesome. Because we're talking about that right now. And I would have, in a moment, said, where's that email? <laughs> uh, so let's see, where was I? Um, so process. Um, so yes, uh, so leadership said, well, maybe we should think about this more broadly, recognizing that this item was before town council two years ago. Um, and so I'll maybe start with that history um, there, and then we can sort of progress forward. Um, so back in 2019, I'll say, the Ordinance Committee spent at least a year, maybe longer, talking about <coughs> marijuana <coughs> licensing and land use in the community, right? This is when adult um, uh, use, I think they call it, became legal or and, and permittable by the, by the state. And so the questions were, you know, do we want to have retail in the community? Do we want to have testing facilities? Do we want to have cultivation? Do we want to have manufacturing? <coughs> and so that conversation, as I said, was at least a year long. I'm guessing probably closer, maybe two years, quite frankly. Um, and as part of that, we adopted some uses 
predominant, and we also created a licensing ordinance. As part of the use conversation, cultivation was determined to really be um, best applicable by, in the industrial and light industrial areas and not, and it was um, concertedly and explicitly pulled out through the council process as being allowed in the RF districts because there was some concerns about predominantly, as I recall it, round odor and certainly all, there'll security. be security issues as well. Um, and so again, I think those, you know, so that, that was the, what was adopted at the time. Um, and so let's see, in the, so for the last two years or so, cultivation has been allowed in certain areas of the community, predominantly, as I said, the industrial district. And as part of that, one of the challenges, and this is the email I just printed out, I'm not sure if anyone's had an opportunity to read that, but Liam Gallagher, our assistant town manager, who really is our lead staff with the licensing of marijuana facilities, um, odor has really been the predominant complaint the town has received. So in that regard, in the last six months or a year, ordinance committee took another look at or odor requirements and actually made some uh, adjustments to the odor requirements, requiring, you know, and certainly we can, I think I put those, that language in the memo, some additional mitigation standards. Um, as uh, Liam Gallagher said in his email, he was unable to join us this morning. He had another scheduling conflict, but um, I'll sort of summarize what his email has said based on, um, so again, this was the email received last night. Since marijuana licensing ordinance took effect, overwhelming concerns of the council have been from odor complaints issued by residents. While we have received a few odor reports from the Pleasant Hill Road area of town, the over overwhelming majority of report reports appear to be originated from the Snow Canning Road facilities located off Pine Point Road. Um, in my opinion, the reason for the significant difference in reports between the two areas of the town is attributed to, one, the age of the Snow Canning facility um, and the very possible porous building envelope the dense concentration of cultivation in the suites, more than 10 separate cultivating spaces, but most likely the facility's proximity to residential homes and neighborhoods. In response to these concerns, Town Council revised the odor mitigation standards to include specific air filtration requirements and air exchange standards for rooms likely to have the strongest odors. Um, while I have received uh, antidotal feedback uh, that the odor has improved since the licensing process began and more recently since the specific standards were defined we continue to receive periodic complaints um, so that's what mr gallagher has to offer at least for this morning and certainly if however this conversation progresses i'm sure we can arrange a meeting with him if we feel that's helpful um, so that's a bit of background. So what are we doing here today? Again, as I said, leadership has asked long range planning committee source to say, okay, if we were to, at least this as I understand the charge, if we are to consider allowing for cultivation in the RF areas, what are the type of performance standards or parameters around uh, that we should build around such a use to protect against the concerns that we've heard in the past. Um, so in the memo, as, as I provided, I did provide you what was originally approved as a performance standard back in 2020 was when the formal vote was taken. But again, being mindful that this language was removed. So, just, um, but I just want to at least provide what was the original sort of starting point of discussion. I think, you know, looking at this based on what we've already learned, hearing about sort of the, the porous building envelope, one of the things I sort of look at is at that point, we're talking about allowing this in temporary structures, such as hoop houses and, and those type of things. Well, maybe based on what we learned, we might want to think about that and some other things as well. So um, I think that's what I have for now, obviously, be part of the conversation, but so our objective is to talk this through in terms of making a recommendation or yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. I think it would be ultimately coming out of committee with some performance standards 
that would go forward to council and say, okay, you asked us to think about if we were to allow for this, what might be the most reasonable way to do it? And again, so far the, the primary concerns we've heard is odor, safety, and in uh, proximity to residential, residential neighborhoods. Um, there may be other things for us to consider, but I'd say at that point, at this point, those are sort of the three, three big ones. Okay, it's coming back to me slowly because I was chair at the time and Mr. Hamilton I'm helped sure. out with this. Um, that originally we were we were sort of okay with RF zoning, um, you know, as long as there was security, i.e., it was in an enclosed area. We weren't thinking as much about odor at that point because we didn't have the experience. Um, but we got a lot of pushback from people in the Higgins Beach area um, because that's RF. Um, for, you know, surrounded. Well, by, yeah, yeah, surrounded that, that by area. Yep. So there was a lot of concern there um, about it. And let me out here, Don. Yeah, there, there were also concerns even in the RF districts from a couple of neighbors who complained of odor, you know, uh, even though people start waiting. We got a big conversation about types of farm odors, you know, like- Right, that's you know, right, that's this right. This what I remember. No, <laughs> you're right. And there, is a, to, and there is a state statute, and I'm digging really deep here, and I know this from real estate, that um, if you move in next to a farm, you know, with horses and pigs and cows and, you know, whatever, too bad, so sad, um, if it smells funny, um, and I know that's not in really legal lease or whatever, with whatever the state sure statute, that's the statute is. reads. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's the intent of the statute. So we sort of talked about that too. And I know off the top of my head, I if we could do something about you know a minimum lot size, perhaps. So there's a lot of offering, so to speak, around near neighbors, and if it could be inside a building. Because I know the police, as I recall, were concerned about it being grown in a field outside that you didn't have a lot of security around. Um, and um, obviously, they have to meet order mitigation standards that we've now set up. Um, the thing I might add in the order mitigation standards, we have a lot of help from Bob Bowker. Yes. Came in and, you know, did a survey, <laughs> and, and that was the basis for developing standards and equipment requirements for scrubbers and that sort of thing, which really had a very positive impact, but only successful to the point that the build, the, the other issues like the building, how airtight it is, how big it is, and farms, and farms and barns, right? They tend not to be real airtight right. structures, right? So, so that's kind of the other issue. You could do all the scrubbing equipment and right. make those requirements, but you don't have a, uh, you know, some, some kind of airtight or close to, uh, you know, way to contain that odor, the, the complaints will persist. So that's the issue that we're having now. It's probably so something to do with the warmer weather coming, people are outdoors, that kind of thing. But we're, we're back at this again. It hasn't really been resolved. So that that's kind of the, the circle yeah. on this thing. And it was a you know fun and interesting conversation about you know ranking on an odor of you know offensiveness. <laughs> if, you know, what's the worst type of harm, you know, dung that but that being said so we we have asked that it come back to long-range planning just for the past through you guys because you have a different you know perceptions and ideas and thoughts and we just want to hear from you okay i, I should have um, if people looked at your uh, memo, memo of december 6th 2019 might have noticed that at that time I had a conflict because we represented some bodies that were interested in doing business in Scarborough. Um, that has, as far as I know, they are now doing business in Scarborough. And of course, at that time, we were talking about what we permitted. The, the clients are all kind LLC, mm -hmm. processor LLC, and it's potland. <coughs> they were just on our. So, uh, but I presume they're doing business in a zone yes. now that's permitted. Yes, they're not, they and we're talking about potentially allowing things in zones so where they're, they're not doing business. So, I don't see that I have any problem in this is a complicated meeting anyway, but I don't think that I have a conflict of participating. Peter, I'll shut it. Okay. 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 
Um, <clears throat> I'll make a couple of comments um, or observations, um, and then um, I'm going to uh, bring out the school here. Um, the, the comments I, I, ha I have is I live close to the snow canning facility, um, and actually not close, close. I'm actually about probably about a half mile away, maybe a third of a mile away, something like that. Um, but if the wind's in the right direction, you can, the odor is there. Um, it's, it's a fairly, it's, it's a pungent odor. Um, and, um, and, uh, and so I think it's, there is a concern even for sort of um, more than a tenth or two tenths of a mile that it's still an impact from a building such as that building, which is an older building to, your, to, to the point it's, it, it wasn't custom built for odor mitigation or something like that. So it's, it's, it's a little, it, it, but that would serve to be an example of the types of buildings that we probably find in the RF district. So um, I'll make that observation from personal experience. The second one is, I think the, as, as I've read the RF um, uh, district, um, uh, uh, section 14 of, of the zoning ordinance and the um, performance standards for agricultural facilities, they clearly envision agriculture as an outdoor sort of activity. Whereas what we're talking about for marijuana cultivation largely is indoor quasi-industrial activity. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't get the same number of complaints for the facilities that are located on running the road, which are, or sorry, on Pleasant Hill, um, which are more in industrial sort of settings. Um, and the industrial district, and we have plenty of space in the industrial districts to locate new facilities for people who want to do business in, in Scarborough. So it strikes me that, that maybe we have a pretty good approach right now by utilizing the light industrial and industrial zone, zones and using the contract overlay zones, which require individual consideration, would require butter um, uh, conversations and would require sort of an analysis of just how close you are to a neighborhood. Um, is I think that probably makes sense. I'm not sure that we, my, my view right now is the approach taken by the town to date, actually it's pretty pragmatic and, and pretty good. Marvin, I think you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. Uh... I have a couple of questions, uh, and they regard, uh, I suppose they regard scale. And I've reviewed all the materials and reviewed the minutes from the meeting a few years ago, and have been on the zoning map. And uh, I suppose my first question is, are the aquifer protection overlay zones in the RF exempt from this? Do they, I, I don't have any idea. Are they, can you have a marijuana facility on a piece of property in an aqua, in, in an AP zone? Yes, so the aquifer protection overlay district really doesn't talk about the type of uses that are allowed. What the aquifer protection overlay district does is it puts additional performance standards in place for whatever use is going in. So as an example, we have a pretty big aquifer protection overlay area that, uh, that overlays <laughs> the industrial district um, part, portions of Pleasant, uh, Pleasant Hill Road. So there is presumably already some cultivation occurring in areas that have aquifer protection. So as I said, the aquifer protection is really about additional performance standards, not about what uses can or can't go in. Um, if that, Jay. Thank you, Jay. I, uh, I, so I might take a couple of minutes here, but not more than that. And I'm starting from a novice position. I had some interest because I have a tiny piece of property in RF with this issue a couple of years ago, and I did participate as a public member. But scale-wise, when I looked at the zoning map, and just correct me whenever I'm wrong, and this is wild ballpark, uh, just looking at it visually, there are 45,000 acres in Scarborough. And when you look at the zoning map, it looks about half are RF. And then about a quarter of those are in the AP zone. But if I'm understanding, this ordinance would apply to my figures. I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm in the ballpark, I think, of about half of Scarborough, uh, which is, uh, what, 22,000 acres. And then if the AP district is not exempt from this, uh, that's pretty much what you're dealing with. 
And uh, when I went through last night and started clicking on properties on the GIS map, uh, the Scarborough map, the size of the property you can have one of these facilities on is roughly 1.8 acres. Let's just say two acres. And when I was clicking on maps last night, certainly west of the turnpike, and I think east of the turnpike too, there are very few properties in uh, the RF zone that don't qualify. Uh, and even if you used, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about 90% of the properties, 90% of 22,000 acres. Uh, and I don't know exactly what that is, but let's, I'm just going to take a round figure of about 20,000 acres. And if the, again, correct me, if the buildings, uh, if you can have of your acres, 25% dedicated to this purpose, well, 25% of what, 20,000 is 5,000 acres. I did the calculation thinking last night that maybe the AP district was, you know, couldn't be included in this. And after I did all my calculations, I came up with a total of roughly 4,000, slightly less than the 5,000 that would qualify for this purpose. And then when I read that, the ideal size of the building is 3,000 square feet. I uh, divided the roughly 4,000 by, by how many square feet there are in an acre, and you get something like 166 million square feet. This is of the 25% eligibility. And then I divided that by the 30,000 square feet, and it came up with 55,000 buildings could be built in Scarborough. I'm sure I'm wrong somewhere in, the, in this, but the scale of this town-wide and RF is astronomical. And uh, therefore, you know, with what Peter said a few minutes ago, I probably am in agreement very generally, but I, I just don't see how under the current guidelines of the size of the lot that's eligible, less than two acres. Uh, I just, I think this is an impossibility <laughs> almost. So anyway, I'll stop there. And uh, I think you got the gist. And I couldn't agree more that it, in reading one last thing, the reading the minutes from the last uh, meeting a couple of years ago saying that marijuana cultivation, land use activity should be treated like any other agricultural activity in town. Well, with all the greatest amount of respect for the work a couple of years ago, I, I, I don't agree with that statement. I think these indoor facilities mm -hmm. change that dramatically. So I think I've made my point. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marvin. I think the one thing I just want to yeah. offer in terms of, as I recall, some of the conversation around the growth being akin to agricultural, I just want to make note of at that time, there was also, if you, I haven't seen much of it in the news recently, but there was a lot of interest in the growth of hemp, which it has every bit, as I understand it, I'm not an expert in the field, but has every bit of the same odors, it's the same, really the same plant, but without the THC component in it. And so I think that was some of the conversation that was happening that sort of got us to circle around this idea that it's similar to ag that, because right now we can't regulate that. There could be any farmer and one who wishes to grow hemp could do that right now. And that's fine, it's like growing tomatoes or corn or what have you. So I just want to make that point of clarification, but I still appreciate your point, Marvin. Um, and the one that Peter made, I think they're, they're you know, uh, just offering that for a little more context. Ultimately, it's going to boil down to demand for that product as well. So if there still remains a high demand for that, um, the land will be at a high value for a potential cultivator. Uh, so I think we weigh that into what Marvin's saying. I think it would be... Um, optimistic to think that the, the, the people would take as much advantage as, as the, the numbers bore out with, with Marvin's um, exercise. But um, 
I think for our purposes, um, we need to have a more broad viewpoint of the marketplace as well. Just, Robin as well. Yeah. Has her hand okay. yeah. Just a couple of things. Uh, and with respect to uh, Marvin's comments, and I appreciate the math yeah. um, and the exercise that you went through. I, I guess I look at this as whenever we're dealing with any of these areas, consider, and considering the IRF, for example, we could have a very similar problem if everybody wanted to put in a big farm. And they can do it today. Everybody in the same space could put in a pig farm and you're not going to contain that odor because it's going to be outdoors. You can't filter it. You can't do anything. So you're going to get that full bore. At least with these facilities, there is some measures intact that would allow us to go through some filtration processes, uh, processes to try to minimize the effects. And maybe if we have our concern is <clears throat> buildings, older buildings, whatever the case might be, if we find that that's a problem that we need to maybe restrict more or build in more um, uh, controls on the construction of the building so that we can get everything or mostly everything going through the filtration systems. One comment. My second comment is more directed towards uh, Jean Marie and Don. When you were going through the process that you were going through ordinance wise, was there at that time, or do we know if there is today, ordinances in place or I don't know if ordinance is the correct term, but controls in place at the state level that say these are the minimum requirements that you have to meet, and are all of those requirements built into whatever we have in our ordinance? Oh, by requirements, you're talking about building standards? Or yes, the, standards oh, okay, for I was going to say there's all sorts of requirements around marijuana cultivation. But I'm, no, thinking, I don't, you know yeah, what I'm, I'm saying? thinking more of the physical yeah. structures okay. that they want to put these uh, cultivated I'm not I'm aware of, but I'm not an expert on what they've been doing up in the legislature recently either. So yeah, I, I got to believe that somewhere along the line, somebody has said these are the standards that should be in place for these types of facilities. Yeah. My understanding of it, and again, at the state law, I'm not 100% not certain, but my recollection is they need to be enclosed but you could do outdoor. I don't think the state yeah. prohibits outdoor okay. marijuana growth. They yeah. need to be fenced in and secured. Yeah. How you do that, I don't know if you have lights, cameras, electric sure. fences. I don't know. But yeah. I don't believe the state mandates cultivation being indoors. Okay. I believe that was the town exerting yeah. its home home rule authority yeah. okay. and taking that next step. Yeah. Um, if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be corrected, but I believe that to be the case. In the I mean, what we did a couple of years ago as a, as a group here and today is the, the filtration primarily is that the biggest difference between the discussions here today um, to determine what the council is looking for from us. I'm just trying to, you know, I got these. Hey, Colin, it's, it's Marvin and I don't mean to interrupt. I, I did want to make add this one point. One of my I don't want to call it an objection. I just, one of my observations is that uh, as it's written, I was talking about these, you know, 55,000, uh, 30,000 square foot buildings that are potentially, you know, I, I realize not everybody in town is going to build one of these things, but that changes the landscape. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a, my objection is not so much with there'll be odors absolutely everywhere, although that's an objection. My objection is if we're talking about indoor facilities, and we are, uh, you're going to go through the RF and you're going to see thousands of 30,000 square foot white buildings. And I think that changes the, you know, I think that changes the changes Scarborough. And I think it's something to consider going forward. Let Alan finish. Yeah. But I, yeah. I'll, yeah. 
I, again, I'm just looking at standards and trying to understand the full difference between what we've had in front of us in the past yeah. and what we're being asked to do. Right. Now. I believe, I'm just trying to get yeah. that. I, I think as far as I understand it, that is the, yeah, that's what changed in the ordinance is building scrubbing. It's building in the scrubbing, right? The odor, the yeah. odor mitigation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I know Robin has yeah, Robin, idea. yeah. Robin. Is it me now? Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so um I'm looking at the memo um, from December and I really caution us to maintain the integrity of this memo because marijuana cultivation is agriculture, uh, whether it's indoor or outdoor. We have agriculture indoor, we have agriculture outdoor. And if you wanna talk about changing the landscape, I would ask you all to think about 30 years ago when there was no Scarborough exit except Scarborough Downs when it was open during our agricultural harvest seasons for horse racing. And the landscape has changed incredibly in the past 30 years. So we wanna talk about changing landscapes. We need to rethink what we've done with the sprawl for the last 30 years. I am, a farm girl. I grew up on a farm, on a chicken farm, which is the most putrescent smell you've ever seen. <laughs> and, but, but it's part of a, a healthy ecosystem so that we can give that manure to other farmers. And I think as long as it's done in a sustainable manner, everybody's going in with their eyes wide open it needs to be, there needs to be a place, continue to be a place for agriculture in this town, marijuana included. I was really disappointed to see the low prominence of both indigenous people and agriculture in the comp plan. And I feel like we are really micromanaging Scarborough and taking it down a really, uh, you know, to, to, to say that marijuana is gonna change the landscape of Scarborough. I really beg to differ. I really, I appreciate the calculations that were done, but in the memo it says, it says the sweet spot for cultivation is around 3000 square feet. We're not gonna have giant warehouses. We're not gonna have, you know, rampant security issues. I welcome you all to go to the cities of Portland and Westbrook and South Portland to see what's happening there due to other issues. I'll stop my editorial there. But I really think that city council did a lot of hard work on this memo and to keep it where it stands. And if, if we wanna put a few more sort of limitations on sort of what their performance standards is, that's fine, but we really need to think carefully about this. One thing I might offer, because I, I think there's two questions happening as, as I can hear, right? The, the, the first question to, to this committee is from council, help us put some performance standards to consider, right? And so I think that's sort of our, our main charge. I think if we can talk about those, and again, I think we've started to hit on some of the, the keystone areas that we want to think about, what's the right lot size, what's the right setbacks, what's the right building envelope to have these things in. Um, I think that's, the primary charge of this committee. I think once we have that, I think it is, you know, a, a fair discussion to have when the recommendation goes forward to council, where does the committee stand as a committee in terms of should this, here's, here's the ideas of the performance standards that we would put in place. We think this is, you know, as a committee, you can talk about, do we think this ultimately is a good idea or a bad idea regardless of these performance standards? So I, I, I think just to help because I'm hearing that that's a good robust debate to have right there, right? And that was the debate that happened two years ago. And I imagine will happen again when this gets before council. I know I've already received at least one email with a resident expressing some concerns about growth in the RF and well, cultivation, I guess I'll, I'll say. It. Um, but be that as a minute. So just to, I just offer that to help in however it helps. <laughs> Yeah, my apologies if I got us off topic, Jay. I just was hoping to get us back on topic. No, I, I, I no. Okay, let's go to Peter and then we'll, we'll, we'll work around. I, 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 um, in the spirit of Jay's comments, I think um, taking it in two steps. Um, in the past two years, we've got experience on the building envelope issue, the building standards issue. 
And it's clear that what's gone on in the snow canning facility has created a lot of complaints. I, I read that into that. So what I would, what we would recommend, and especially as we think about rural things, it might be appropriate to require as part of the performance standards for marijuana cultivation in any district, that it be placed in a new new building that is, I don't know how to write the standards, but you know it, it's it's tight, you know it's, right. it's it's airtight or it, it should be appropriately filtered because what's what what took place in Stone Canning just it, it's not working for that part of town. Um, as opposed to um, as, as we think about sort of the the, the zoning recommendation, it sounds like we might have a, a, a distinguished disagreement of opinion, which I think happened back a few years ago. Um, <laughs> this is not uncommon to have. Um, I would register mine again. I come back to what I said, which is I, I, I don't think we're going to transform the rural district, but we've got industrial districts that have not yet been fully built out, still have plenty of lots that somebody could buy into or lease and create a, 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 a facility in a place where people expect um, potentially smelly industrial stuff going on. Um, and uh, and if 3,000 square feet is the sweet spot, we don't need to use rural, um, large rural spaces for that. We have plenty of spaces in the industrial and light industrial um, zoning areas. So again, just thinking pragmatically, not just think about whether marijuana is agriculture or not, or whatever, whatever it is, what we've got on the books right now would seem to work for the scale of what we're talking about as a town. So mm -hmm. and then we'll go to Marvin. So, oh, oh, goodness gracious. I, I got sidetracked here. Uh, Alan, Alan first. Alan first, Marvin, yeah respectively disagree with you. We are woefully <laughs> in need of yeah. more industrial and light industrial space here in town. So you might want to have a conversation with someone like Karen, who deals with this on a daily basis, and she can let you know just how little we have. Um, so in terms of that argument, I would say there's not, we want to be careful with that. That might be a different argument, though, because I, I would be fine adding any more light industrial industrial zoning areas, which might be, a, which is different than the use of rural. All right, okay. that I have no issues with. If we yeah, okay. figure out where we do that. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, in the areas where we currently allow, like at snow, to get the building itself, just one. Do we currently have uh, exclusions in terms of distances to neighbors and stuff of that nature in the industrial zones where we currently allow manufacturing? The only, as I recall, the only separation distances we have are from like schools and, and, and childcare centers, things like that. We don't, I don't believe we have a separation distance from neighborhoods or what have you. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess what I'm thinking is that if we've got already in place uh, limitations in the industrial zone and we're considering doing this in a different zone, we may want to use those same limitations just so that things don't get real confusing uh, within the zoning. I'm, I'm just... So, so what I might be hearing is if, if, you know, as I go back between presumably this meeting and next meeting, we'll try to put something together is take a look at what that, if we currently say, I'm just gonna grab a number, 500 feet from a childcare. Maybe what, I, what I'm starting to hear you say is in the RF, say 500 feet from a childcare or from a, an abutting residential lot? I'm, I'm saying keep it the same. So if we specifically say a number for childcare and we specifically say a number for residential areas. Yeah, I don't mean, think we do currently say a number for residential areas. I just want to be clear right. on that. And I, I think that was, and I just want to just, I think as I under, remember the conversation, that was the concern in the RF. Because okay. the RF is predominantly, right? As someone right. already said, it, we did a heck of a job growing residential in our right. rural areas for the last 40 years, yeah. right? So that is what I recall the predominant concern by the citizens being. I think Allison Bristol was one who really helped voice that very well yep. and articulate it, you know, sort of said, hey, Higgins Beach, we're surrounded by RF and we're all, you know, quarter acre 
if even that lot yeah. smaller. So, so there um, should be some consistency. Yep. I, I guess is what I'm saying. Yep. Whether it's whether we pick up 500 feet, a thousand feet, not exactly mm -hmm. sure what the right number is, but I just think we should be consistent in whatever we choose. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, can we go to Mar Marvin? Had his hand up here. Then Rick will go. Yeah. Uh, I agree with with that. Uh, and Jay, I'm answering your question or responding to your outline of what we're talking about. And it's, uh, I mean, uh, basically, lot size is one, right? And, uh, and what, uh, what was just discussed, when I look at the minutes from a couple of years ago, I read, it stood out to me that uh, Jean Marie, it was you, I think, who are credited with this, credited with this, that uh, we should not be looking at individual overlay districts. And mm -hmm. I, I did not understand why that was ruled out wholesale. And I would uh, suggest that uh, in the two or three different things that we're recommending that we, we uh, recommend reconsidering that idea. Again, rural farm, uh, 22,000 acres we're talking about. Um, there's nothing like it in town as far as a district scale-wise goes. So I, 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 I respectfully suggest that as well. Rick? Yeah, yeah. just... Jay, do the, do the setbacks that you're referring to apply to cultivation facilities and schools, or is it just you know, retail facilities? So we don't allow retail facilities. Right. Uh, okay. So I, I will have to look to see if it's cultivation and the ma manufacturing, if it's just manufacturing, if it's just cultivation. <laughs> I don't recall. I'll, I got to be honest. Uh, but I can take a look. And As I recall, there's something about maybe under state law that. Oh, right. Retail facilities had to be so many yeah, right. from schools and daycares. Yeah, right. But if we don't, we're not talking about that. We don't allow right. that here. And I'm just wondering. I, I have looked whether the setbacks currently uh, apply to marijuana cultivation hmm. facilities. Yeah. And you know, the second point is, and I appreciate um, the the. The analogy to pig farming <laughs> and the like on smell. I, I don't know whether this is an issue that should be or shouldn't be considered, but I think marijuana cultivation facilities have different, they're unique in the mm -hmm. sense that I don't know any statistics on this, but are they the kinds of facilities that could conceivably be open to more criminal? You know, somebody want to break into these facilities right. and and it's one thing if it's in a part of town where there are a lot of other surrounding, you're less likely to have that type of activity with a facility that's located in a relatively built up area versus one that's off. But that's West the reason Garfield, for the security. Which, yeah, yeah, which of course is sort of, it, it cuts against the, the whole issue of smell. Because if, if, I'm, if what I'm saying is, let's put keep these things in more developed areas because it's less likely to be criminal activity, <laughs> the, the smell issue becomes more prominent. Exactly. If they're in the rural part of town where there aren't as many residences, right. maybe the smell thing is less prominent, but then is it, mm. is it something that's more open to potential criminal? I don't, I don't know. I don't have any statistics on this. Um, I just raise it as an observation in considering we allow these sorts of things. And I did, just if I might, just on the sort of criminal activity, and that means people trying to break in. I yeah, just want to be yeah, clear right. what I'm talking about is not. Right. Um, I did ask Liam Gallagher that question, like, have we had much issue with security? And to his knowledge, we aren't getting a ton of those calls. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist or what other have you. Parts but, of the states Right. Just sort of offer yes. the observation that I heard, but certainly we can check with you later. Please. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jean Marie. Yeah, I, I'm just sitting here, and I'm not the expert on code. I think I'd be more so now, but I'm looking at the RF, and I, I just have a question. We've got under special exceptions, and just so you know, I'm in the RF zone. So, um, there's a under C1, it says agricultural processing facilities. 
with more than 2,000 square feet of gross floor area. Would cultivation come under that? It, marijuana cultivation would be its own use. So certainly if we felt like that was a, a, a reasonable performance standard to put in, and just so folks understand in our zoning ordinance, I, most of you probably understand this, but we have permitted uses, which are things people can come in and get a, a permit from our, our code officer for single family homes, accessory um, buildings, what have you. Special exception actually requires board of appeals review. And so the board of appeals does a first review and sort of says, how does this fit with the overall characteristics of the neighborhood? And assuming people can meet those conditions, you know, it's not going to have, you know, a different traffic pattern. It's not going to have whatever it may be. Does it fit with the characteristics of the neighborhood? Again, there's, you know, six or seven pointed there's items. There's some performance standards yep. that are mentioned under get section 9Q. Yep. Um, and and I'm not familiar with 9Q. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to hand this back. To sure. Okay. Just to give some background of that, somebody on the zoning board, um, generally speaking, that agricultural processing facilities, we've interpreted to mean things like um, if you've got a, if you're, if you're growing herbs, right. you're probably got to have a, a, a building that you're using to put them in packages to, to, to ship right. them or things like that. Whereas a, a more challenging um, uh, uh, use would be where you're bringing in things from other farms or you're bringing in um, uh, other people's products and, and using it to, 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 to make something else. Is an abattoir sooner? That's abattoir? actually, there's an, an old husband. You know where they kill animals? Yes, <laughs> and there, yep, there, yep. that's, that's so, actually included yes. in the uh, in okay. section uh, 9Q under the Slaughterhouse, yeah, yeah. You know, oh, the abattoir. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, I don't think it's under 9Q, but it's under, under another um, uh, special exception um, uh, thing where animal husbandry or commercial yes. husbandry, which includes potential abattoir. Or, or, or. And, and the only reason I bring it up is because we do have something under the RF. <laughs> the firefighters are waving at me right now. Um, the, under the RF, you know, can we work something in there is what um, Yeah, one of the things as, as this conversation goes on, thinking about the consistency with other zones, I know when you just referenced animal, animal husbandry. Mm -hmm. We have a certain lot size that's required yes, that's for right. animal that's husbandry. Right. So I'm thinking, you know, as I go back over the next right. couple of weeks, right. I'll look at what what's that current standard? Is it right? Is it two it, acres? I don't believe it is. I believe it's larger. It You're going to have bigger critters, smellier yeah. critters. Yep. Right. <laughs> Although chickens are small and they smell, so <laughs> maybe size doesn't matter for smell. But I'll and take if, a look at that. And where I'm going with that is so. Potentially, could we do something under RF? But we've got some exceptions because I noticed, like, if I wanted a nursing home, it's an allowed use in RF, but you got to have a certain amount of acreage and yeah. blah 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 yeah. blah blah yeah. blah. So, yeah. and, and uh, not um, uh, well, what I would advocate for is I think the contract zone process gives us a similar flexibility. Um, it, it's a little bit more involved. It's not just going to the zoning board. Um, it's in getting an exemption, um, or, or sorry, not an, uh, a variance or a, a special exception to, um, appeal approved. Um, but to me, that makes a little bit more sense given, and again, I'm thinking very specifically about the stone canning um, facility. And it, it, I think we should, for the rural district, either think carefully about some sort of building standard, yeah. which seals the building and make that really tight. Um, and if you had that, then I'd be much more comfortable having a special exception process in the RF district. And a limit on size, potentially. And potentially, exactly, yeah. Um, uh, but if we can't get there on the building envelope question, or if that's too difficult for whatever reason, then I'd be more comfortable looking at the contract zone exceptions because it is a higher standard and, and, and the council can, can look at it. I'm not a big fan, I'm not a fan of them in general, but it's I think avoiding, for this purpose- It's avoiding zoning. The, for the purpose of this, maybe it's the right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just for full disclosure, I my son-in-law is involved in uh, growing marijuana. Um, he is a correctional officer down in Rhode Island, and fifteen of them have gotten together uh, to form a consortium, and they're now building two five thousand square feet buildings in Norton, Massachusetts. Um, by the time they got to look at innovation, it was too late. I certainly was trying to get him up here so I could actually see him more than three or four times a year. Um, his job is security uh, and IT. So we've had a lot of conversation around issues of security. And 
there is a growing rash of organized crime out there uh, that can use angle grinders and get through uh, cement blocks to, to steal 50,000, 100,000 uh, dollars worth of plants. So security should be like under consideration. In terms of the, the planning board, please give us something very specific. Because one of the things that we are accustomed to looking at, for instance, is lighting. Full cut, full cut off lighting is that protects the neighbors. Uh, except if you have a real difficulty with security, what kind of security lighting should we be looking at to have somebody have on their building? Chain link fences. Um, is that going to be something that you would require to increase the, the uh, security? How hot? Uh, completely surrounding the building, how far away are trucks inside the, the security, outside? In other words, think all of those things through. We would require knock boxes on the gates, the security gates. Uh, give us the criteria, the measurements that we can look at something and say, yes, the setback is correct. Uh, take a look at um, the electricity. These places use massive, massive amounts of electricity. They use massive amounts of water. Where is that water gonna go? Is it gonna be recycled? Is it going to go where? Uh, so, Think about what we will have to do on the planning board in terms of when somebody comes before us and says, we want to put 5,000 square foot building here, or we want to rehab a building that we have, they think about providing us with some really specific guidelines to apply. And I know I saw Robin's hand up, um, but I do actually, that's a really good point in something that and I know we have another item on our agenda. We're yeah. hitting nine o'clock. So we need to think about how we want to try to get through everything today when we push. Anyway, I think it'd be helpful to have a more robust conversation if this is an activity we see needs to go to planning board. Right now we exempt agricultural uses from going to, to planning board. And we've obviously had a diverse conversation around that point today. So I think that's something we all need to be thinking about because um, that really will have to inform because I don't think our site plan standards are very, it would be very tricky to apply our current site plan standards right. to this type of activity in the RF. So we need to be mindful how we do that. So that's a really good point. But, but all, all, also rehab buildings in light industrial. Right. Sure. As well. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, we're not going to get to the end of this today. So I yeah. think we need to round this up, uh, come around so we can get to other agenda items. Yeah. So let's go to Robin and see if we can close. Yeah. Thank you. I have to go to an emergency dental appointment too, so I'm I'm going to let you all go. But I I I I think that Rachel is on the right track. We need to be prescriptive with our building requirements. All of these things, um, whether they're land requirements too, and and this is helpful also to the farmer so that they know what they need to include in their financing package for the business yeah. month. So having these performance standards um, to meet the public benefit needs is exactly where we need to go. I think that the contract zone amendment in this, if if uh, whoever the applicant is comes forward, if, if they wanna do contract zone amendment, they need to understand then that they would still need to adhere to whatever rules come out of this process. Because I would hate to see this contract zone amendment come and have one set of standards and then or next year and the next contract zone or something else. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, would be uh, unfair. But uh, so I do not support a contract zone amendment for this, and I'm headed off to the dentist. Thank you all so much for the time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I think with that, I feel like I've heard. I've got some pretty good ideas here. I've heard a lot about the building. Think about lot size. Think about buffering, and then you know, dragging out sort of the, the existing standards we have and sort of seeing what consistency makes sense or at least identifying what's there. And then we can talk about whether being consistent makes sense. We want to be more or less restrictive, but we can certainly talk about those. So I think I can put some parameters a little bit more together for our next discussion meeting. Okay. Yep.
Well, sir, I'm just going to add to this one final quick statement. I think we're really on to something that's a, this is a more complex issue. You know, some people have highlighted the fact that it can't be viewed only in isolation, only as a growth issue in a rural zone. It's a lot more complicated. I want to circulate to everybody stuff that's coming from the the advocates of the of the grower and the, you know, the community, the folks that are involved in this commercially, uh, and and this will give you an idea of kind of what's coming. Um, you know, the kind of licensing fees. So as, as the laws change at a high level in terms of liberalizing these, these things, it's going to have an effect firm to market, you know, all the way through. So um, yeah, it was a really good discussion. Thank you. So we'll talk about this at our next meeting. I'm not sure we'll get this resolved in any quick fashion. But, um, so unless there's closing comments, we'll move on to the next item. Good. Item three, discussion of Fowler rezoning request on Highland Ave. So, Jay or Karen, you have a couple open. Yeah, and I know we, we, um, we've got a few members in the audience who certainly will speak more knowledgeably. I'll try to pull some things up on the screen so folks at home can sort of see what we're talking about as well. Um, looks like we have some paper maps maybe to look at, but this is a zoning request that I think I referenced in the memo really started a number of years ago when we're right in the throes of the plant process. And Mr. Fowler has been very, uh, very kind and over the years in his email saying, where are we now? Where are we now? And, um, you know, so I appreciate his patience and all that and not jumping down my throat for the time it took us, but that's the way it goes. Um, so anyway, we, this was something that came up through our cop planning process, not only from Mr. Fowler, but we actually heard from some others saying, you know, hey, we live in these RF neighborhoods, but everyone in our neighborhoods got half acre, three quarters of an acre, we're all non-conforming lots, mm. you know, does it, can, can't we become R2 or R4 in, just in this neighborhood? And so I think broadly we thought about that issue and said, you know, yeah, maybe there are pockets of our community that we could write zone, I using air quotes, and, and, and sort of at least make people conforming to what they are and historically have been. Um, and so there is language in the comp plan that I pointed out in the memo that speaks to that. Again, the comp plan, this comp plan not being prescriptive, but more of a, a guidance document doesn't say exactly where we should do that. So this is really that first request coming to us saying, hey, is this an area that makes sense? And the area we're talking about, I'll pull up the map so folks can see, is along Highland Avenue, um, pretty close to the Black Point intersection. Um, and so I think, I'll leave my introduction of it at that and allow the uh, Bellers uh, and the representative to walk us through as I pull this stuff up. Okay. And when I introduce Hi. yourself. Thanks, you say, uh, yeah. My name is Troy McDonald, Northeast Civil Solution. This is Richard Bowler, owner of uh, R80 Lot 13. Um, and as Jay mentioned, uh, we're in a situation where uh, Mr. Fowler and his neighbors sit in the RF zone right between two R2 zone uh, lines. And we're looking to ask for it to be uh, reclassified as R2 and the neighbors all on the Northwest side of Highland Avenue um, are also uh, in agreement with that proposal. Uh, we've provided um, signed letters, if you will, from each property owner indicating that they, they would like to see that happen too. Um, I believe if you look at the, the zone map, the tax map, you, you can see how it's the, the RF zone is sandwiched. Um, Sorry, the lots in the RF zone on the northwest side are sandwiched between the two R2 zones. And it would appear it's a nice clean uh, revision to connect the R2 zones on each side of uh, Mr. Fowler's property and the abutting properties. In a nutshell, why we're here. And if I can just help explain the, the map folks are looking at. So the purple outline are all the properties that are requesting rezoning. You'll see on the outer edges of the purple, the shading changes. That's because half of those properties or a portion of those properties are already in the R2. 
So it's that darker shaded area that's in purple, that's currently RF. Um, and so that, again, it's the purple outline, that's sort of the darker shading that's requesting to change from RF to R2. And the difference uh, between RF and R2, again, just very broadly lot size, RF typically requires an 80,000 square foot lot for single family. R2 is 20,000 square feet per single family. Um, there's some other differentials, but I think predominantly that's, you know, at least for now, I'll leave it there. Public oh, sewer and water. I don't know that question. Yeah. You know, you is it the, uh, the back line, the straight line? That's the railroad, right? Okay. Correct. Yeah. You know, if there's utilities, uh, uh, I can't there's recall. No, and there's no sewer or water in that. I, I put water across the street. So I, my lot does have water to it. You have public water? Yes. Or on the, that number 42. Yes. Yeah. Which one is 42? Sorry, that's the first one. Yeah. Lot 13. This one? The, the largest one. Sorry, uh, right there. Right there. Okay. That one. This is Mr. Fowler's property. Which has uh, currently has an acreage of eighty nine thousand square feet, yeah. and so the uh, uh, lot, lot, sorry, lot uh, twelve just to the to the left would appear it's shy of that of eighty thousand. But I'll confirm that. Second. Jay, remind you remind us or me if about what lot size needs to be for septic? Uh, 20,000. Okay. That's yeah, right. still 20, yeah, that's the minimum. And then a separation, but if you've got water, you don't have to worry about that. The well separation. Right. There's well separation. Those can be waived, but yes. Right. So, but okay. so 20 feet. Yes. Yeah, it's it's feet. Yeah. So, Jay. Hey, Dave, this is Marvin. I don't mean to interrupt. I have a question. Yeah. And, uh, very general question to the applicants. Why, why do you want to change it from RF to R2, uh, you know, for the five-year-old and me, kindergarten student, just very simply. And I have a tiny little lot just anecdotally in RF. Uh, this is my background for my question. And uh, I'm sort of delighted that it's in RF because I imagine I don't know that uh, my property taxes would go off up slightly if it was an R2. Uh, so I'm wondering, I'm probably wrong, but why you want to go from RF to R2 and raise your property taxes. But generally speaking, will you please tell me uh, and, the, and the committee why you want this change? My, my daughter's in Scarborough and they're looking to uh, purchase a home. We know the inventory is just not there. The converting to R2 will allow us to take that 89,000 square foot lot and create additional buildable lots. Thank you. Okay, I didn't realize that all the property across the street is also RF. Where correct? All those subdivisions. All those. Yes. Yeah, so that was the question. So across the street, and really mostly of the lots you're seeing here, I'm circling now on the screen for folks. The predominant number of these lots are in subdivisions. Um, so, and those. Um, those don't have, what it's worth. Those don't have public water or sewer. Yeah. It sounds like public water yeah. must be in the area. Yeah, and okay. sewer right. maybe over there. Um, so yeah, Highland Ave. There, I don't think there'd be water. Yeah, water. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are on sewer and some are not. We're so going to stop oh, sharing so I can get folks ahead. Yes, exactly. That's right. See, like I said, I'll pull up the GIS while the conversation goes on here. Everybody else. Okay, so everything else on. What the northeast and southwest of this area is already R2? Yes. Uh, everything you're seeing in yellow is R2. Again, across the, the train tracks, so left of page as you're looking at it, is largely in the RP because, uh, was it uh, it's escape, it's escaping me right now? It's a Libby comes up or none such? Why am I? Yes, it's Libby. 
So, so, the, yeah, okay. so, I was so the proposal is to essentially continue the R2 right. through the bank right. of the, the northwest side right. of Pilot Avenue. Yes. I, I guess I'm just, I'm not sure I have a problem with that. I'm just surprised to see that everything on the southeast side of Pilot is RF. I, I always thought it was, I'm, I'm I guess I assumed it was R2. I'm, I'm with Rick on this one. It, it, it's, it's an odd shaping of the RF district boundaries and yes. with what is RF down there. And, and again, I'm, I'm not sure I have any issue with, with your rezoning proposal. It's just kind of an odd, more of an odd expression generally about how the RF lines are drawn in that section of town. Was there a reason to extend RF across Highland Avenue to that area? So Does one of the that things, reason no longer exist? So I can pull, I'll pull up the zoning here in a moment again and sort of talk, speak to that. It's very historical, so I'm going to be taking some wags at it, but uh, but I think they're uh, they're uh, informed wags. So I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But just so folks, I just brought up on the screen utilities were the questions. So what you're seeing in blue is water, green, yellow is sewer. Um, so again, the properties we're really thinking about are up here on this side of the road. So you can actually see water has been brought across the street. When I say across the street, I mean to the side of the street of the request um, for a portion. Looks like maybe right to this Fowler, is this you right here or my? No, you're down here. Correct, right. So yeah. what you did is you tapped in across the street. I right. see. Yep. And so sewer, the yellow is private sewer. So I don't know how a future connection to that would go. That's a part of the association. Yeah, and yeah, yeah the sanitary district. That, that might be a little trickier, but it does appear at least water is in the area. Um, actually, I can pull up the zoning right from here. Can I? Yes, I can. So, as I said, my my take on why the zoning is the way it is, and let me try to zoom out. And look too far. Sorry for the uh, my supply point. There it is. Come on. There we go. In there. <clears throat> the zoning lines used to and still do in many areas basically the town would just take a measurement off the main drag say 500 feet 250 feet typically 500 feet and just run it down the line and say okay there's the r2 so really that's what i think we're seeing here along um uh, black point road and then i'm not sure what happened with this little nugget why yeah you know, um, and again, so uh, this committee working through the uh, 2006 comp plan many years ago actually did the TBC3 zoning pocket that we're seeing here. Again, this being a little Black Point village area. So that was very discreet that's where, area. That's where the um, garage is. The yeah, that's where shop, yeah, the yeah, shop. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, you know, this, this R2 has always interested me, these lines, like, yeah, that, that, that's what I'm getting at. It, they're, they're, they're obviously, they, they measured off something, but I can't figure out. They're, that was back in the like, day. Yeah, that, 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 that was way back. That, that, yeah. that was, I, when I was growing up in South Portland, when I was nine years old, that my best friend moved over there to that new cool development, Pleasant Hill Roads. That was like the bee's knees back then. What would be the development implications of, of changing this to what R2? Uh, you know, I did do, shucks, I did do a back of the napkin. <sighs> and it's not a Mr. Sewer. Then does it, is it back? I, I guess I'm getting at, we could have denser <laughs> residential development right. with more on-site sewer, right. does it pose a risk to the river? But what, what I'm sort of surprised at is the southwest end and the northeast end, they're already on right. Yeah. So right. as a practical matter, we're almost there. Yeah. Right. So it seems like it's there's some logic in changing it to R2. Yeah. I guess I'd like to just know what the development implications would be. Re really, 
on site sewer system yeah, yeah. any constraints. Right. Yeah. Well, looks like well, they have to follow. Uh, I'll share this again. The rules, right? What I'm, what right. I'm sharing is have three uh, lots in this area. That's, right. that's three septic systems. If it's changed, you could have say six. But you can drink water coming out of some of these. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. that. <laughs> it is very small. But I'm just saying that it. seems to be the right. issue. So that was actually the question that uh, town the manager side was RF. Yeah, I would say well, somebody must have been concerned about protection of the right. So what did I come up with? Right. I came up with somewhere in the range of 10 to 18 new house lots. Big, big range because you know this was back of the napkin stuff, just looking at the mapping, trying to think about frontages, but then there are other restrict. I don't know if there's wetlands in the area that would be right. taken at, you know, so right. there's, but that gives you some idea that right now, you know, there's probably so anyway, but even in our that, that was the, the scale of potential development but for, for like wetlands that's going to come up on a on a, a code um, discussion right. anyway. So yeah. yeah, right. Again, I just want just to give sort of the I think the question was what's the sense of if we do this, right. what's the potential growth? Ten to eighteen lots. Now whether again sort of back to our discussion, everyone's going to do that. Right. Probably not. Maybe they will. I don't know. Um, From yeah. a as someone who advocates for more affordable, and I don't mean that, you know, in the affordable housing, but housing that's affordable for the workforce housing, or for what we call the missing middle in real estate, um, I think this makes perfect sense, um, because, you know, the R2 zone just, just extended along there, um, you do have the railroad tracks behind it. Uh, which will, some people aren't going to want to live there because they don't want to live near the railroad tracks, but that factor makes these, these lots potentially more affordable uh, for people. And I, I think it's a great idea. That's my opinion. I think that's a good point, although I don't think we should be talking about zoning changes as they relate to affordability in this instance. I think if, if, the, if the council is looking for our advice, I mean, my, my thinking would be make sure you understand what the development potential is if this is rezoned with, a, with an emphasis on the implications of a lot more on site septic systems than otherwise are permitted. Beyond that, it makes no, I don't see any issue with it. I don't, I don't the only the thing I would like to see as part of it would be the extension of the public water along the front of those well, properties. True. Yeah. So that we'd at least have. Be extending that. You make that a part of something that the developer has to do. So I, I, I don't know if we can do that, but I mean, I, I just think that it would make sense yeah. since it's available right at the beginning right. of that yeah. property right. that we extend that down to pick up. Right, and then they stub into it. Right. Exactly. Right. And, and if, I, if I knew, I, the council, knew that an increase in the number of on site septic systems aren't going to be significant impact or any impact on the RP. Yes, I have any problem with this one. Marvin, you had your hand up. Oh, mine's the devil's advocate question uh, that I don't know the answer to, obviously. And that is, if, if this is approved, is there anything preventing the next property owner further to the east, I'm going to say, uh, saying well we've connected that what about this section um, it, it's in the sense of establishing a, a uh, precedent is there any reason to think about uh think about that no which east are you talking yeah, about everything on the east side of island well y yes all that whole rural farm area sandwiched between the two uh our two districts uh, it's already all developed. It's all developed. I mean, there's a 500 houses in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Houses. I, I, houses. I, think it's, I, I think it's an interesting question, Marvin, but I think it speaks more to the why is this RF in the first place? It's, it's a weird pocket of line drawing that put this zoning in place. It, it, it doesn't seem like, I, I think if the next people came and asked that question, we, we, it's worth asking why is that? Why are those lines drawn where they are today? Um, 
question I started. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I agree with that, Peter. I, I mean, you're you're attacking it for or looking at it from the other side of the coin. I agree with that. Uh, and that's, thank you. Yeah. My guess is just, some, this is a wag guess, okay, <laughs> is that you have the road there and then you have, and you have the tracks. So the developers weren't interested in being near the railroad tracks. They were just pushing for yeah. their side of the tracks, if you want to be funny about it, um, for development, and it just got left out. No one was looking at it. I mean, that's just the way it happens. So to me, why don't we just make it consistent with that strip going along there? It's already a developed area, um, and it gives more opportunity for people to live in Scarborough. Just be just something Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, would, I would at this point move that we recommend the rezoning. Yep, I think there's a general consensus. Yeah. I have no issues. I mean, yeah. <coughs> okay. Favorable recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do in the council table. I know I'm not either, but I'm advocating. Do you want to add anything else to this discussion? Oh, would you stop? Thank you. All right. Okay, and so I, guess, I heard a yeah. favorable recommendation. We haven't typically in the past voted. I guess I'd ask our council members what would be most helpful with a minute a reflecting a formal a vote, vote would, would be. be good okay, so I heard a motion. Oh, sorry, Mr. Minute. Chair, to jump in on your. Nope, uh, that's okay. <laughs> got a second. Got a now. second. Yeah. All in favor? So the, the motion is to send a favorable recommendation. Yeah, yeah. correct. Rezoning. And I will do a, a roll, call. roll call vote. Right. Dave. Alan. Yes. Peter. Yes. Rick. Yes. Marvin? Yes. Those are our voting members. Priorities good. Yeah, exactly. So just a question to the group. Is there an appetite to do a little more cleaning up on the lines or are you just I, I was just looking at that and quite frankly, where you would want to try to do the cleanup on the other side, the properties are all there. They're all you know, I I can't see, I'm not saying it would never happen that you would get three or four people who would sell to make a bigger space, but I think the chances of that are pretty small. Yes. And actually, if we leave it as an IRF, we won't get right. more and more subdivision in that area that's already determined. I, I would say leave it as is. And I do think that's, as time goes on and priorities you know, we we're able to check the box. That might be something that we look at more globally, um, which sort of lends to the next item. I know one of the things we had on our agenda was to get back to the, the spreadsheet. I sort of knew we wouldn't based on the fact that we had two <laughs> other items and I think that's okay. Um, one of the things that we talked about and Peter, thank you for pointing out that I had said, hey, all right, once we do the reshuffling and I've sent that out, we have our top priority staff will start to at least give some parameters around what those might be. So one of the things that sort of came up, and I think Dave or someone mentioned it, you know, as much as, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out what our priorities, something's going to come up. Well, darn, if something didn't come up that staff sees as a priority for this committee to work on probably through the summer and into fall. And that revolves around our MS4, our, our stormwater permit that we have, that's a federally mandated permit. We are actually into a new permitting cycle. And trust me, I'm gonna have Angela Blanchett and Jamie Fitch come to our meetings who are way more knowledgeable. And so I'm just giving you the, uh, not even 10,000, 100,000 foot uh, view of this thing. We have a new permit coming down the line. EPA and DEP are pushing more requirements down to the town around what our requirements are for doing their work. I mean, it's just, there's no other way to say it. They're making us, they're mandating us to do things that um, but the good things to do. Anyway, um, we are, as part of that, required to have some draft ordinance language around certain elements for them to look at by September or October. So we need to start working on that. In my discussions with staff, I think this is a really good opportunity for the town to take a look more globally at our stormwater standards. Right now, we it, we're very vague. The language has got to be 30 years old. You know, we just don't say a whole lot. So there's, there's good opportunity here for the town to be more explicit 
and developers to have a much clearer understanding of what the expectations are going to be when they come to the planning board. Um, by and large, those that work with us frequently know what we're going to be looking for, but it's really sort of policy level um, right now is not well documented. So I think this is a really good opportunity for the community to jump on, frankly, what was one of the uh, action items in there. So again, like I said, that's very high level stuff uh, or look at what I think is priority work for us. Um, and I think this is a good community to help usher that through because it's really around zoning work. So- um, Doesn't maybe, Robin have some expertise? In that Robin area? would be, I think she'd be jumping through the screen with excitement as I say yeah, these yeah, things. So I yes, so. so yes, uh, it's actually what she does in her yeah, professional no, world. So we have some real good expertise here um, to lean on, not only on staff, but sure. uh, like always on our committees, we have experts in all sorts of fields that are wonderful to lean on. So um, I just wanna offer that. Yeah. And you, I don't assume we're pulling up the spreadsheet now since we're at nine, whatever yeah. we are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, are we spot on? Wow, yeah. not bad. So yeah, we'll table that yep. for another, another day uh, and concentrate on these things that have a higher priority for us. Um, we have any public? Uh, that wants to comment at this point. We do. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Allison, yeah. Hi. Um, hello, everybody. And um, sorry not to just raise my hand, but apparently that um, I was invited to participate as a participant versus watching via YouTube. So um, I wanted to comment on the uh, marijuana discussion, and I was. Uh, Jay was right that um, this was discussed, I want to say, for more than a year. I participated yeah. in every ordinance meeting. I went to the planning board meeting. I went to the uh, all the council meetings. And myself and uh, other people were very vocal about not allowing marijuana cultivation. And Jay, I think the, the how it's uh, worded in the ordinance is cultivation and related manufacturing. And um, so I was surprised to see this come up again in just two short years, and also surprised to see it come up as a discussion in the RF district triggered by one the request of one property owner. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the concern, uh, the concer same concerns two years ago remain the same concerns now and I think people were pretty loud and clear about um, you know not embracing it in the RF district certainly um, in in the uh, Higgins Beach area along 77 um, and the other point that I want to make is odor was a concern was the primary concern and we all, I, I can only speak for myself, but I think it's fair to say that we all felt that we dodged a bullet when the when the <laughs> problems arose over in the Pine Point Overlay District. And, you know, the town was responsive, but it became the neighborhood problem to have to live with this odor until the town found a solution. Um, I would say that odor, safety, and residential proximity re, uh, remain a concern. Um, chain link fences and bright lighting and security would be out of character for this neighborhood. Um, I and you know just from the lighting standpoint, I think lighting was one of the concerns when the new phase of Piper Shores was under consideration as a contract zone. So. Um, Probably, uh, Mr. Freilinger, if I if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I think you said it the best, and I think you said it succinctly, and I also agree with um, uh, Mr. Gates's point about if you know this is something that the town wants to consider in the RF district, that perhaps they can should consider an RF overlay because it would just be you know out of place in this area. So I thank you all for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Alice. Jan, I didn't catch the name of the speaker. 
Allison Bristol. Allison Bristol. Oh, her name's not up there. That's interesting. It was. It's it was. It was. Yeah. Yep. It's Bristol. Any others out there? Uh, no. Nope. Nope. Did I do that? Okay. Nope. It's us. Anybody have closing comments? Otherwise, a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All in favor? Take that by a show of hands. Nobody yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dissents. Thank you, Marvin. We'll see you later. Thanks, Marvin. Thank you, Allison.